Hello, good afternoon. Thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, we're thrilled to be doing a Google Hangout today on the issue of early childhood education, childcare, and uh, we have a really exciting panel of, uh, of experts who can join us here. My name is Peggy Nash. I'm the Member of Parliament for Parkdale High Park. And I have to start off with a, a kind of a confession that I have been advocate for quality, accessible, affordable childcare pretty well all my adult life. And some of the folks that we're having a discussion with this afternoon I have worked with over the years advocating for uh, just uh, such, a, such a program. I have to say as the Member of Parliament for Parkdale High Park, uh, I hear from parents all the time who tell me they're spending thousands of dollars to uh, put their kids in child care. Uh, it's like a second mortgage. It's, uh, it, that's if they can find a space. So it's, it's really a, a problem that I hear from locally uh, quite a bit. But uh, it, it is very broadly a problem in Canada where uh, except in the province of Quebec, where they do have affordable child care and it's not a perfect system. Uh, and it's expensive. In fact, out of 14 uh, similar countries to Canada, 14 developed countries in the world, Canada is at the very bottom when it comes to providing child care. So what parents are experiencing in terms of that stress and that cost is the reality for, uh, for people right across this country. It's not just a family, individual issue. It is, in fact, a national issue. Now, this week, I have to say, I was really thrilled that Thomas Mulcair, the leader of the New Democratic Party, the leader of the official opposition, announced that childcare is going to be a major election plan uh, for the NDP in the upcoming election. And specifically, what the NDP is committing to is uh, accessible, affordable, quality childcare to enshrine this in legislation and to fund it with an eight year plan going forward so that there's long term stable funding so that. Uh, parents will know and, and childhood educators and child care providers will know that, uh, that this, there, there is some stability to the program. Obviously it takes working with the provinces, with the territories, with First Nations to make sure that the program responds to local needs. But that's, uh, that's the plan and uh, as I said, we'll go out over eight years. Initially, it's going to cost uh, about half a billion dollars, but that will grow to about two billion dollars uh, over the first four years. And over that period, the commitment is to create 370,000 childcare spaces, but the funding will increase over time. Um, some people have asked uh, whether this means that the current hundred dollars a month parents are getting for ch per child will be cancelled. No, that's not the case. That won't be touched. It's like the old style baby bonus that some of us remember. That won't be touched, but this new program will be phased in. So I just wanted to, to throw that out because that was very exciting news that happened this week. And now I want to bring in our panelists. We have five terrific panelists. And what I'm going to do is introduce them one at a time, ask them to say uh, a few introductory remarks and then we'll engage with, uh, with our viewers because we're already getting comments and questions coming in. So our first uh, panelist is Martha Friendly and Martha's at the University of Toronto. She's the Director of Child Care Resource and, and Research and she specializes in early childhood education and child care policy. Uh, she's a regular commentator on early childhood education and um, has been a long, long time advocate of the uh, National Child Care Program. So, Martha, welcome. You're in Toronto. Why don't you? Yeah. Begin? So, um, I guess I, I guess the way I want to just talk about what what state we're in with 
child care at this at this point. I mean, why do we need an election promise of a national child care program? Well, the reason is because we don't have one. We don't have any kind of a national Canadian Canada-wide policy or program or even approach. And I mean, I guess from my point of view, most of the provinces don't have very well-developed approaches either. There are different pieces that different provinces have. Essentially what we have is not a system but a market. And um, it operates like a market in everything from how child care centers or spaces get there to how parents pay. Parents are the biggest uh, parent fees are the biggest uh, funder of the of child care. Most parents use a completely unregulated child care, the bulk of parents. And overall, for Canada as a whole, um, we have, uh, for kids zero to five years old, we have spaces that cover only 22.5% of them, I'm sorry to say. And that doesn't mean it's affordable. So those spaces are not necessarily funded. It's just that there's a space there, and depending on the province, if it's in Quebec, the space will be relatively well funded from public money. In other provinces, um, the fee may be as high as $2,000 a month for an infant, and that would be in downtown Toronto, Peggy. I'm sure your constituents have, um, have experienced this. There are, even within that, there are particular problems uh, f with people who have infants, uh, children with special needs. In some places, there's virtually no school age programs. Indigenous communities are particularly very poorly served wherever they may be. Um, people who work non-standard hours, rural communities. So essentially what we have, and I know this is really a cliche, but we have a, we have a patchwork. And I, um, just to, I'll leave off by commenting on the fact that what's happened in the last couple of years is that there's been a recognition that we have um, child care and we have early childhood education in the form of kindergarten across Canada. We've had for some years, generally for five-year-olds, Whereas in some countries, these have been pulled together to become essentially one program or one system. Ours is still very fragmented. And I would comment that even as the provinces have moved towards having full-day kindergarten and moving their child care programs into ministries of education, it's still very fragmented. And I know that that's what parents here experience, and it's the same kind of thing they experience across the country. So, um, you know, I think that that's probably enough because I'm sure that we'll get... Oh, I guess just one last thing that somebody will comment on. The, the core of any good early childhood education and care program are the early childhood educators. And this is kind of you can't have good quality unless you have well-trained people who are well-paid and well-treated, and that is not the case in Canada. So I'll leave off with that for now and come back and form questions. Thanks a lot, Martha. Yeah, we will in a minute get into the whole issue of the educators themselves and talk a bit about their importance. But I, um, I, uh, I'd like to turn now to Jamie Cass, and um, Jamie is the co-chair of the National uh, Child Care Working Group, and uh, she has been a long-time advocate of the Universal Child Care Program, and she's working on the rethink child care campaign and Jamie just I know you're, you're going to make some introductory comments and I just want to throw something out something that uh, I heard on the media during uh, during some discussions this week and what one person said was well child care it's okay to to have public funds going into child care for low-income people but why should it be a universal program you know the uh, you know, somebody who's quite wealthy, why should they get child care? So I don't know if that was something you were going to address, but uh, it, it, if you could uh, comment on that in your opening comments, I'd appreciate it. So Jamie, I know you're in Ottawa. Over to you. Yeah, thanks. Well, it's a pleasure to be this. This is my first time on a Google Hangout live on the air, so we'll see how we do. But it's interesting just to hear your introductory comments, Peggy, and then Martha, because what we started to grapple with in sort of that broader, uh, with wor broader working people was just uh, the child care issue generally. So it was like, think child care is just your problem? Well, we can think again. Um, and so many families are struggling with, you know, decent child care, good quality, scrambling to piece things together that they can afford. And that's both high-income and low-income parents. So I'd say that what really has been left out of the system are both 
ends of the system and middle income parents. So it's sort of like everybody's been squeezed out either because there are no services or the services are not affordable. Um, so it's sort of interesting that we all sort of speak from the same place when it comes to putting together childcare. So we started to think that we need to rethink this and rethink the way um, that childcare is is really not a public issue and should be. So what we've been hearing from a lot of working people is it's my own individual responsibility. I'll try to piece something together. I'm on my own. I might be really lucky. It's amazing if you talk to parents how many times you hear, I was lucky. I was lucky to find someone or I was unlucky and I had to change my childcare arrangement right away. But what they lacked when you talk to people together is that it's a collective problem and maybe there's something wrong when it's all a matter of luck and maybe the government has a role parents have a role and social society has a role so we've been doing a broad-based campaign with working people talking about um, what their childcare experiences are and we've called them kitchen table conversations and they've gone on across the country from Newfoundland to the north to the Yukon to uh, Victoria and we've been doing it with people who just come together and talk about their experiences and offer what they had. Some people didn't have kids at all, some are grandparents, some have young kids and what's so interesting is to hear their stories and they start to talk and come to the realization well why if we're all having this problem is it this way so I think that we don't want to see one income group pitted against another group in fact you know I've seen kids from all income levels play together and the joy that comes out of kids that can you know ch children with special needs having access to good quality child care. Child care staff, early childhood educators that can actually afford to, a child care space to have their kids in programs. So what we've been learning from having these kitchen table conversations is that we, uh, we need collective action, that we have a collective problem, and that as Martha says, we can't let the market um, be the, the reality for so many people. One uh, media commentator say that uh, yes, it is childcare is mostly in the market, and it has been a colossal market failure. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's that, true. That said well. Uh, thanks for that. And now we have joining us from Sudbury, uh, Noreen McChesney, uh, who sorry about that, who is a community services manager. Um, for Child and Community Services, and you're the president of the Association of Early Childhood Educators for Ontario. So, Maureen, we're really glad to have you with us today to present that perspective of the early childhood educators. Um, I understand you've been uh, involved with children and families for over 20 years. You've been on the, the board of directors of the early childhood educators for, um, for uh, two years and have worked uh, in various capacities in the early childhood education sector. So um, I do see your mic is muted, so just a reminder to unmute before you start, but uh, love to hear from the perspective of the people who care for our kids, so go ahead, Nareen. Thank you, Peggy, and it's a real pleasure to be here. I have to say, um, I'm obviously the Google Hangout nerd because I have the full-on headset, not the earbuds like cool Jamie, um, <laughs> because my internal mic on my computer isn't working. So nerdy it is. Um, and I have to say that over the years um, working in the field, uh, I'm sitting here and, and pinching myself because 20 some years ago was when I first saw Jamie speaking um, with the Ontario Coalition for Better Child Care. Uh, 21 years ago might have been when I first um, saw Martha um, 
you know, at one of the one of the you know institutes or conferences that I'd gone to. So uh, I'm really um, ooh in good company and very excited. So um, I, I, yes, I'm representing the uh, Association of Early Childhood Educators of Ontario as the president elect, which which um, I'm still um, very very glad that we still have our president um, Rachel Langford with us for the next year. Um, and, and I think basically for ECEs in Ontario, really there has only been the single voice addressing specifically ECE issues, uh, and it is the Association of Early Childhood Educators of Ontario. I mean, it's our job to ensure that um, with our, our board of directors, uh, like the direction of our board of directors has been um, to focus the, our advocacy work on professional pay for professional work. And really it is um, our job to ensure that wages, compensation and working conditions um, are always on the table when these types of wonderful um, ideas and conversations happen. So um, we know that accessibility and affordability are, are big issues. Uh, I've had quality, affordable, accessible, um, inclusive childcare on my brain for the last 20 some years and those are again words that I'm, I've echoed through my esteemed colleagues here but um, a lot of the time has been spent on accessibility and affordability to parents because they are the consumer and that's completely understandable. We really um, want to ensure that um, our response touches on the workforce and that when we talk about high quality, affordable and accessible programs, quality really is to Martha's point I believe and uh, to Jamie's point, um, at the heart of the quality is the registered early childhood educator qualified and capable staff as a recruitment piece and as a retention piece good solid working conditions and and wages so we know that uh, we are a, a, a very uh, underpaid workforce and and the parents have been able to afford and access child care through subsidies etc but it's time that um, we take those subsidies off the back of early childhood educators and off the backs of their wages. We know that um, our advocacy work, advocacy work is being focused on this because with the College of Early Childhood Educators being established in Ontario, we are um, a now uh, legislated, professionally credentialed um, labor force and it's time that it's recognized. So when, when we're, while we're extremely thrilled with the announcement um, of the national high quality affordable childcare program, we also recognize that early childhood educators are the backbone of quality childcare and um, a quality workforce needs to be recognized with um, the appropriate compensation and recognition. Thank you so much, Noreen. Uh, absolutely correct. What we don't need are more low-wage uh, poverty jobs. It, this, this work is priority work because this is about caring for our kids and we want to make sure that there is quality care. So thank you uh, for that perspective. Um, I want to call in now, and thank you for coming uh, and be parting, being part of this Google Hangout from Sudbury. My pleasure. <laughs> um, so next we're back to Ottawa to Shelley Bird, who is with the Canadian Union of Public Employees. And Shelley has been an early childhood educator, uh, education activist uh, for over 20 years. And she represents the early child, uh, early childhood educators and child care workers. And um, uh, it, uh, she's been on the, the board of the Ontario Coalition for Better Child Care, and I used to be a member of that board many years back. So, uh, but anyway, uh, we're very, very glad to have you on uh, on this hangout, Shelley, and uh, over to you. Hi, Peggy. Uh, thank you very much for having me uh, on this panel today. I'm, I'm here uh, representing the Child Care Advocacy Association of Canada and, and I want to I'm sitting on the board of the uh, CCAAC and I want to tell you that we have been working incredibly hard over the last number of years without the funding that we used to be able to enjoy to be able to articulate and put forward the needs and interests of both parents, children and the workforce and to bring attention to the issue of early learning and child care at the national level. Uh, I, 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 we could do a whole different show about the defunding of people's organizations that are trying to bring issues forward at the federal level. Um, so we've been very active uh, uh, 
keeping child care front and central federally. We've been active working with our national uh, partners and with our members in the provinces to continue to talk about and put forward the need for a national child care program. Right now the CCAC is working with uh, with the Child Care Federation of Canada and with uh, Child Care Resource and Research Unit to host a national conference, Child Care 2020. Uh, we're, uh, this conference will be in, uh, from November 13th to 15th in Winnipeg where we are bringing uh, people together uh, from across the country to really have a good discussion about what can, can Canadian families need what children need in terms of action from the federal government. We're pushing to make early learning and child care a number one priority in the federal elections and, and we have to say that the, the announcement by the NDP uh, about uh, your child care platform has been uh, real pivotal for us as we try to work to make child care an issue in this election and really work to get a, a national system of early learning and child care. Thanks so much, Shelley. Uh, the the uh, in November the child care conference I think will be a pivotal moment in terms of focusing people's attention nationally. And uh, our message is that child care is one election away, and that uh, there's a plan that's concrete, that's affordable, that's doable, and we're prepared to do it. So hopefully, uh, the conference will will really provide some focus to that. Thank you. Um, and now we have a parent's perspective, and not just any parent, we have Shani Halfa, who is uh, a parent in our area, in Parkdale High Park in Toronto. Uh, Shani is also a child care researcher and advocate, so she knows of which she speaks, and um, both from a, a theoretical perspective, but also very concretely from a parent's perspective. Shani, great to have you with us. Over to you. Thanks, Peggy. It's great to be here. Um, I love all these people on the screen here with me. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm, you know, I am a child care researcher and I'm a trained early childhood educator, um, but I came into child care as a parent. And, um, you know, I was one of those lucky ones that we keep hearing about around the country. I was the lucky one that got the infant space. I was the lucky one that got the subsidy. And those things fundamentally changed the course of my life. I mean, they actually gave me the opportunity to go back to school, to create a career for myself. Um, and they also fundamentally changed my child's life because, you know, I was a young single mother and I was struggling with the idea of staying at home with a, a young child. And I was able to access a quality space where I had support as a parent, where I felt that you know my child was being cared for um, in a safe space that allowed me to maintain the things in my life that I needed to do to be healthy that I could take care of her better and that she was also getting what she needed so I mean that really is how I view um, child care from a personal perspective and why I think it's so important that ev all parents have access to what I had access to. Um, it's not about, you know, whether they're rich or poor and it's not about um, where, you know, who, you know, where they live. It's it's that I believe that this, that child care is something that we all do together, that we absolutely have to do together um, because it makes such a huge difference, not only for working parents but for children as well. And, and the other piece about that is that right now the way that child care uh, is set up. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of responsibility put onto parents as you know boards of directors in these nonprofit community-based programs. And it, while it's wonderful that we're involved in these programs, um, at some point it becomes really difficult to balance both the needs of you know affordable care and what that care co costs. Um, and paying the workforce, paying the people that do the work caring for our children. And I think that, you know, 
it's really because we don't have a system and we don't have enough funding and so we have to take on that burden and make those decisions and it's just not sustainable. The other thing I just want to point out is that even with all my, my knowledge and experience and being trained as an ECE and being a researcher, I still struggled when I moved to find a space. I lost my childcare subsidy. Um, so, you know, it's just sort of speaks to how challenging it is um, to navigate the system and to access care and then to pay for care. So, you know, I think that's, that's a really core issue for me. Jenny, thank you so much. Uh, and I have a question uh, for you, but I'm going to first of all ask a question of uh, Martha. We had a question come in from Isabel Giraud on Facebook, and she is asking, why does Canada have such a huge problem? I'd love to know the answer to this, Martha. Why does Canada <laughs> have such a huge problem with the issue of universal childcare? when strong Western countries like Holland, Scandinavia, Germany have implemented it decades ago with great success. Why are we so behind the times? Why is that, Martha? <laughs> the $64 million question. I mean, we've talked about this a lot. And I mean, there are a couple of reasons that you can point to that are kind of political and ideological, and I think that's part of it, um, which, I'll, which I'll mention first. But I, I think the fact that Canada is a federation which has really been pointed out by Tom Mulcair and the need to negotiate these things between the federal government and the provinces makes it more difficult to actually do social programs. Um, so it's easier for countries that are unitary states and, and if you get the right national government they can just do it. So it's a it's a it's more of a challenge in Canada, it's not that we can't do it. But the other thing is that the kind of um, country that Canada is ideologically we're not a social democratic country like um, the Scandinavian countries that have a, a great deal of depth in their social programs. We're with the countries that are basically the uh, countries that have less strong welfare states um, anyway. All the English-speaking countries are in that category. So those two things kind of mitigate against it. It doesn't mean that it can't happen, but those are kind of what are always pointed to. And I guess I just want to point out that to some extent, it's a matter of luck because, you know, in fact, if we had elected, if we had been lucky enough in the 1970s to elect a government that wanted to press through with it when we were creating social programs, we might have had a national child care program much earlier. So, you know, I think that it's just like parents. There is, there's a matter of luck. And don't forget, you know, we did have a, a beginning of a, of a national child care program with the liberals, actually, we would have gotten something off the ground, and Stephen Harper came in and canceled it. So, you know, like it's a mixture of politics, ideology, and luck. I mean, I, I don't know any other explanation for it, and maybe this time we'll be more lucky and better ideologically. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I'm counting on it. Yeah. I am too. <laughs> um, I've got. Uh, a couple of folks have uh, have written in, and I, I just want to share their story briefly. One is from Kat Armstrong, who says that they were on the wait list 12 months for a preschool spot that um, which was faster than the never spot they got for infant daycare. Uh, their second child will be starting to lose two and a half because there's no affordable space. Um, they got a subsidy for the first, but it only saves $300 a month. And we all know how expensive infant childcare is. Um, woman, she's uh, opera, Kat is operating her own business, and $36 is just not affordable. So that's her experience. And then we also heard from Michelle via email. And she lives in our community. She's got two kids. Uh, one's two and a half, one's five months. They're, she and her husband are both professionals. They earn a good income, uh, but they spend upwards of $3,000 a month for two children. And uh, she, she has a long, uh, a long email here, but it's, she says, you know, unless we get a kind of a universal system, she says, we're going to need almost like an RESP for daycare because people yeah. just can't afford it. So anybody, we have talked about affordability, but anybody want to make a, a quick comment about just 
how necessary this service is. Well, can I just relate this, Peggy, to what you said about some of the talk um, in response to the NDP proposal is, well, maybe we should have it, but not for wealthy people, yeah. right? And I think this is one of the most interesting things that's come up in this whole thing is that that's one of the main objections. Probably, I mean, I don't know the person who wrote in, but there are a lot of professional two-parent families that people would consider to be wealthy who make good wages, but given the cost of childcare, there's no way that they can afford it. And I think this is one of the pieces, I noticed that Andrew Coyne wrote this in his column in the um, National Post. It's, I think it's misinformation. They don't have a clue about what childcare actually is costing people. I mean, you know, you could sort of say that if somebody's like in the upper one, the 1%, one Maybe they really couldn't afford childcare, but it's not worth not having a universal program for the. You know, it's that old mythology about the wealthy banker's wife. There's not a lot of them. The reality is, especially if you have two children, um, people, even two-parent families who make good incomes, really cannot pay it on a on an ongoing basis. That's why we need to have a universal program. One of the reasons. There's there's a number of other reasons. So that's just my view of it. Yeah, and I think I think that what yeah. oh sorry Jamie go ahead. Well, I think that's also what we find is that a lot of parents haven't experienced it. Like I find it interesting to hear Shani talk about her experience as a as a parent and what it meant to her to have her child in a good quality setting with other children with good early childhood educators. And I think what we have in this country is such a problem with access and affordability that a lot of parents have never experienced what it's like to have good quality childcare, right? Mm -hmm. And that's also what's made it more difficult. So I, I also find, you know, that the, the conservatives had no problem reinstituting, like Mother's Allowance, the $100 uh, a month benefit and making that universal, but the same people are arguing against an accessible system. And what we've heard through our kitchen table conversations is that when parents find out about what Quebec has done at $7 a day for childcare, they find, wow, it's doable. We can do this, and this is what it could look like. And yes, we could use this for our kids, and for our family, and uh, I think it makes lots of sense to do it. So we're thinking that childcare is the rallying point for a new vision of uh, Canada, and but that could be what our message is. Around here, about the seven dollar a day program, they're just they're either you know they they really want it or they're furious that we don't have it. But I, I want to pick up on your point about quality. Um, Noreen, what does quality childcare mean to you? <laughs> um, you know, I, I was asked this question in an interview once. And I took it from the perspective of a day in the life, uh, I, and honestly, before Charles Pascal, a day in the life of Jamal, mine was a day in the life um, of a, a small child entering with her, with her family into a childcare program, and and the experiences that that child would have, and you know. It, I don't need to do that here because it would be very operational, but high quality, um, you know, in my mind really means that uh, the staff are um, trained professional trained professionals and registered with the College of Early Childhood Educators, that they're, that they're paid um, higher than just living working condition wages, and that they have, um, el that they're eligible for benefits and that they're eligible for pension or retirement savings, that um, they have working conditions that are um, uh, conducive to productivity, to that caring, nurturing environment, that they're supervised by um, early childhood educators as well who are um, in tune with their need for continued professional learning, that they're in tune with their need for uh, self-care and making sure that the educators are, are taking care of themselves, that they're in tune with um, how those educators are so skilled in child development as well as parent communication. And, and developing strong working relationships with supervisors, educators, and with parents. That um, quality means that 
a child care center is ready for any child who walks through that door, whatever their needs are, whatever their um, culture may bring, whatever their family makeup and composition may be, uh, and, and whatever is needed at the time. And that, um, that takes time and investment, and it takes um, the commitment with intention by the supervisors and executive directors and by the, by the educators. And where there's a political will, to, um, to Martha's point, then there should be an early childhood educational way. And, and quality childcare means all of those things. And of course, I need to touch on uh, a high quality planned curriculum that supports children's learning through a play inquiry, um, play based, uh, inquiry based learning. And uh, I think all of those pieces, in my own muddled way, uh, add up to quality. Thanks very much. It's, um, so uh, I, when I hear you talking about trained, uh, well-trained staff who have uh, where, where have good working conditions. Um, Shelley, from a child's perspective and from a parent's perspective, what does that translate into? What what's the difference between quality childcare uh, from your perspective for a, a child and a parent? I guess if I were at, uh, to articulate uh, quality, I know from my own work, because I worked for 20 years with infants and toddlers, so I know as a, a staff person what it takes for me to be able to spend the time developing relationships with each of the children, uh, developing trust with each of the children. That is real tender uh, time that is required. So I know. Uh, it's important uh, to, to have small group sizes. Uh, the children need to be in groups that they feel safe in, that they've got lots of room to move in, that the uh, uh, teachers, the ECEs, have lots of time to spend one-on-one -on -one time. Uh, coming into a program where you've got well-compensated uh, uh, staff who uh, have um, are in centers for a long time and can and can have the time to build those relationships. So staff continuity, staff staying in a program because they're respected, valued, and well paid and compensated creates quality in programs. It's critical that we support staff. Thanks so much. Now we're almost running out of time, but I want to get in one question from Cindy who, who asked via Twitter. Um, she says, my generation um, uh, was uh, many of them were, were more likely to stay home even though they were very well educated. Uh, how do you get more young women to see affordable daycare as a quality issue for their future and get them on board? And Shani, I'd like to ask you that question. We only have about a minute for you to answer that. Okay, great. I have a really long answer, but I'll keep it short. Um, you know, it is really challenging, and I think this has always been a challenge with childcare, is that parents don't realize, you know, people don't realize it's an issue until you're a parent, then you go through the process as a parent, then you come out the other end and you go, whew, I'm done, not my issue anymore, right? Um, but I struggle with this with, you know, with my generation, because that I had the same experience. I did not think about it, but I think what it is, is that it's not just childcare. Childcare fits in with our, you know, with our with our social uh, programs and our social safety net as a whole, and I think there is a disconnect. There's there are some pieces that we take for granted that we, you know, we just kind of have, and, and but there's a disconnect with what's missing um, that affects us all the way along. Now, I think hopefully it's going to change a little bit because as we, we were talking about this earlier, more people have now gone through and experienced childcare themselves as young children and so that might be a le that might be a point to yeah. kind of get in with younger children and say remember when your mom was at work remember when you were a kid you know and it might actually be something that resonates because now we have a whole generation that has had moms that went to work right and had good or bad experiences which might both inspire so it's but that's that's a challenging question to answer in one minute thanks so much Shelly I uh, yeah. You know, I, uh, I, I want to make the point that back when they brought in the um, $7 a day, was $5 a day, now $7 a day child care, the workforce increased with women's participation by 70,000. So that was positive. I also want to make the point that the Toronto Dominion Bank 
says that for every dollar invested in early childhood education, uh, with the benefits to provincial and federal governments range from a dollar forty-eight to two dollars and seventy-eight cents. So it just makes sense economically as well. Um, I want to take a minute and just promote a child care petition at ndp.ca slash child care, which is about uh, expressing support for the need for a national child care program for the NDP to make this a priority issue and to make this happen after the next election, one election away to a national child care program enshrined in legislation. We could talk for a much longer period of time, as some of you have said, we've been at this for many, many years. But I want to thank our really amazing panel. I hope you've had fun today. Shani Halifan, uh, Shelley Bird, Noreen McChesney, Jamie Cass, Martha Friendly. You have all been amazing, and I know I've had a lot of fun hanging out with you and Google this afternoon. So, uh, thanks a lot. We'll have to do it again. And let's get to work for childcare. All right. Thanks, right Peggy. On. Thank, Thank you, Peggy. Thank you.